Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the December 14th regular council meeting. First order of business. Black Falls Town Council acknowledges that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and a traveling route to the Cree, so too, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Um, adoption of the minutes. Does anyone note any errors or have anything to uh, add? to the agenda for this evening, administration? Uh, yeah, yes, Your Worship. If we could add uh, item 8.1 under action correspondence, and that would be a uh, request for a letter of support for the Alberta Junior Hockey League Showcase. Thank you. Council, anything to add to the tonight's agenda? Seeing none, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? Councilor Spock. I'll move to adopt the agenda as amended. Any comments? All in favor? That is unanimous. And our, we do have a delegation this evening, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Vern, Rinko, R sorry, Vern Rincock and Thomas Fryer from the uh, Alberta Regional Rail uh, between Edmonton and Calgary Quarter. Good evening, gentlemen. Is that that presentation on the end? There we go. Um, how do I, can I advance it or? Um, I can click through for you or do you have a USB? I do have a USB, yeah. Okay. Okay. General, if you're if you're comfortable with it, I think uh, you're far enough away from us. If you want to remove your on okay. face sure. yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> okay, so Ben and I have electric drill rail. So I'm going to go through a little overview of the presentation. So, why do we travel? 
current trends. Boeing Regional Rail, so the benefits of Regional Rail, the alternatives to building Regional Rail, what Alberta Regional Rail plan is, and some examples in North America. So why do people travel? Well, we travel for work, business meetings, sporting events, tourism, game days, for social reasons, to meet with family and friends. Although a lot of travel has been curtailed during the pandemic, post-pandemic, people will still travel. Maybe not as much as before, as a number of people will be able to work from home. However, there will always be meetings, other collaborative events to engage in, and game days and sporting events to participate in. The passenger rail service that is fast, efficient, reliable, and safe allows parents to work in the big city and allows kids to ride their bikes on the streets, bringing the rural communities closer to the big cities. These are the latest numbers from the average annual daily traffic count since 2019 on the Calgary Edmonton Corridor, 32. In the section of the South of Road there, there's a minimum of over 31,000 vehicles a day, which is a 20% increase from 2010. 36% increase in 2005. In the section north of Red Deer, there was a minimum of, of almost 27,500 vehicles a day, which is a 25% increase in 2010 and a 43% increase from 2005. In total, almost 52,000 vehicles a day travel through Red Deer. Being majority two lane highway, when there's a collision, one lane is closed, which leads to separate severe journey delays. Sometimes the highway can be completely closed in one or both directions. In winter, there are increased driving hazards. It includes ice, snow, blizzards. And when driving on the QE2 in the winter, you'll often see vehicles in the central divider or in that shoulder. With a total of over 106,000 vehicles a day into Calgary, and a total of over 112,000 vehicles a day into Edmonton, when the QE2 gets into Calgary and Edmonton, the number of vehicles will become so great that traffic will is reduced to a crawl. A journey that could take 30 minutes in frequent traffic can take an hour or more. As you see by the graph, travel within the current Red Mountain Corridor is only going to increase. Current highway capacity has reached its limit in some areas and will soon reach capacity in others. Something will need to be done. So why regional route? High speed is not a prerequisite. There will be multiple stops along the way, as the aim is to serve all the towns and cities in the Calgary Edmonton Corridor. The aim is to use the Canadian Pacific right of way. This passes through the principal communities, towns, and cities in the Calgary Edmonton Corridor. This has the advantage of intensifying the use of this existing transportation corridor. This will make it cheaper to construct, as land will not need to be purchased, and a significant amount of the required infrastructure is already in place. There's already a railway line there. The goal of passenger rail is to take cars off the road, leading to lower congestion levels. Also, as passenger rail has the ability to take cars off the road, the need for highway construction and expansion has delayed by, reduced or delayed by many years. People who switch from a car to a train would benefit from cost savings. No longer would you need to pay for the car insurance. There's no longer need a car. Oh, well, you'll be driving a lot less, so no need for fuel, less wear and tear, maintenance. The time savings. The maximum legal speed limit on the QE2 is 110 kilometers an hour. However, a regional train can travel its regional train can travel at speeds of 180 kilometers an hour, even within built-up areas, where cars can be limited to 50 kilometers an hour. High productivity. What can we legally do in a car? All you can legally do is drive. What can you do on a train? Oh, you can read, send emails, watch videos, catch up on your TV shows, eat, drink, just relax and rest. We can do so much more on a train than we can in a car. That makes it a far more productive means of transportation. And the fact that we can relax and recharge also makes passenger rail a far less stressful form of transportation. Additional, additional benefits, uh, new transportation options. No longer would residents be reliant on their cars or on other people that have cars. With fewer cars on the roads, the roadways within municipalities have become more inviting to cyclists and pedestrians. 
realms by far the lowest emissions of any of the motorized mass transit forms. And with these hydrogen fuel cells, it will be a zero emission form of transportation. By bringing the rural communities close to the big cities, rail can, can promote an alternative living, working employment choices for the residents. The young will no longer feel the need to leave in order to work in the big city. And those that are older, or of health conditions, can stay in their communities if the medical appointment will only be a short of praying right away. There are also those that cannot or do not drive. They will no longer be around in others to get them where they need to go including those who can't drive because of age or disability. Regional rail will provide access to affordable transit that would cover the entire region. Not just for people to get to Edmonton or Calgary, but for a student to get to Olds College, Redbeard College, or Berman University. For patients to go to for a medical appointment, or for somebody to meet with friends in the next town. Passenger rail enables people to take trips they would not normally take family trip to a local tourist attraction, a day trip just to get away for a while. When the weather is cold and nasty, a person will likely decide they don't want to risk a white nut knuckling on the queue too. Also, if a person may be feeling a little bored, just wants to get away for a while, they can just hop on a train. With regional rail, destinations within the corridor become more accessible. As well as the various tourist attractions in Calgary and Edmonton become more accessible to residents in the corridor, the various tourist attractions within the corridor become more accessible to all the residents in the corridor. Whether it be a pop concert at Rosary Arena, or an ice hockey game at the Eagle, Eagle Center. As well as year-round attractions, there are also seasonal attractions. Stampede in Calgary and K-Days in Edmonton. There are also sporting events, rodeos and powwows that occur throughout the corridor. During, during the Christmas season, a number of towns and cities put on special light displays. Festival of Lights. With fast regional passenger rail, additional or special trains can be formed to accommodate these events. Battle of Alberta trains, Christmas trains, so people can view all the lights up and down the corridor in the various towns. You have a beautiful light spread out here. As well as getting people to a destination, the train can also be the destination. For example, the Rocky Mountain Inn. With the regional rail system, there are various types of special trains that can be put on either a special consist or a particular locomotive or cars. Special lunch or dinner trains that showcase local produce, night trains for stargazing, sunset, sunset and sunrise trains that visitors put up in local hotels. Regional rail can also provide people a safe ride home. You can have a few drinks with family and friends in the next town and catch the train home. You can watch your favorite sports team play and win in the big city. Make a night of it, and safely get home. Busing is only really a short-term solution that would require dedicated bus lanes in the longer term. A relevant example is a flat-iron flyer between Boulder and Denver. The total distance is 47 kilometers. The bus service started in 2014 with the purchase of 59 buses. The ultimate goal being passenger rail service. 32 kilometers of high often sea vehicle toll lanes have recently been completed for a total cost of just under 900 million US dollars. Or 14 and a half to 27 and a half million dollars per lane kilometer. When the Fast Tracks project was first authorized in 2004, commuter rail service between Boulder and Denver were expected to start in 2025. When the first phase of the high frequency vehicle toll lanes were completed, they was pushed back to 2044. With the high frequency vehicle toll lanes now completed, there is no official start date to when commuter rail services will begin in the Boulder Denver area. But a new passenger rail initiative has been introduced called Front Range Passenger Rail. This proposal envisages passenger rail service from Pedro in the south through Denver and onto Portland in the north. People think that it's cheap to build a road. These cost estimates for highway construction come from the 2006 U.S. Federal Highways Association and have been converted into Canadian dollars and kilometers. In rural areas, highways can cost between two and a half and seven point four million dollars per lane kilometer. This is the cheapest as there's plenty of room for construction machinery activities. In urban areas, highways can cost between three point nine 
and $15.8 million per lane per kilometer. This is because space becomes a little bit more limited, they can restrict the size of the machines and some construction activities. When restrictions become required, highways can cost between $13.6 and $60.7 million per lane per kilometer. These include nighttime road closures, all the construction and detours. The southwest portion of the Rain Carrier Ring Road currently under construction is estimated to cost at least $7.5 million per lane per kilometer. It's important to remember that the road is at least two lanes, there's one in each direction. So you can pretty much double every single one of those numbers if you were to just build a road. The aim of our Virtual Regional Rail is to establish a rail network in the Calgary to Toronto Corridor, connecting all the towns and cities, providing an integrated transportation network. Using the existing Canadian Pacific right of way and upgrading the track to allow higher speeds and an increased number of trains, to provide a frequent, fast, reliable, efficient, sustainable, and safe mode of transportation. Building stations within the urban areas in order to enhance the communities and connect with local transportation infrastructure, creating the integrated transportation network. In order to use the existing right of way, Alberta Region Rail would use CFR compliant freight compatible rolling stock, similar to what is used on Via Rail, Go Trains, XO in Montreal, and the West Coast Express between Mission and Vancouver and BC. Rough cost estimates based off the Calgary Bow Valley Mass Transit Feasibility Study of 2019 would suggest that tuning the existing line would cost less than $7 million per kilometer. The complete station would cost about $25 million. For comparison, a twin line has a greater capacity than a four-lane highway, which is, as mentioned previously, would cost $7.5 million per lane kilometer, making passenger rail a quarter or less cost of the equivalent highway and far more economical than installing high-frequency vehicle lanes in the Q2. In order to create a fast, safe passenger rail system, at grade crossings would need to be altered by means of construction of bridges for vehicular traffic. And we, Alberta Regional Rail, would work with the local municipality in identifying which roads they would like to see a uh, bridge installed. The ideal funding source would be a public private partnership model, utilizing the Alberta Community Transit Fund, the New Building Canada Fund, and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. Roadship in the Calgary Corridor can be estimated to be at least 5,000 passengers a day. And there are many examples of similar passenger rail services across the United States, as shown. All these passenger rail services run on existing freight lines and use compatible running stock. So you see, there's lines in Nashville, Florida, there's, lots, there's actually quite a few in Florida. So this is only just a, a limited number, there's two dozen, over two dozen similar rail systems the United States. The last thing is if the community and the sanity of Black Bolts would be willing to issue us electric support for this project, right, that we can have and uh, we can show to the Canadian Stretch Bank, because that's one of their requirements when we discussed we met with them in the summer. They wanted to see municipal and community engagement and if there was support within the communities. <coughs> Thank you so much. Any questions? Anyone any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Stanley. I'm just curious, how many other communities have you been to and how many letters have you received so far? We have we have received uh, seven, <coughs> seven in the last week. So we're tasked with us to, uh, yesterday we had a special council meeting with the council we tasked them and we had to join. Um, so County Staff was the first to join about two weeks ago. Um, they're very excited to see how they can link uh, some existing rail line sort of into this spot that we're proposing. We will have a natural support from the Samsung Korean Nation, and we are in uh, an agreement kind of getting into a partnership with the Mindskin to, as a, to actually work together as a formal grouping as well. And also have kids brief as well down in the south, they so sent us natural support. Subsequent, if I may. Um, so, if this were to go ahead, how many additional trains would you estimate would go through Black Balls on a daily basis? 
How many, here's a good question back to you. How many currently is it 80% currently going through? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, through the chair to C.O. Johnson, do we have any idea how many trains we have go through here every day? It's much more than 10. I think so. Yeah, varies. Yeah. There would be an increased traffic because there would be additional passenger trains. And what CP would do would be up to them whether having a an enhanced twin railway line would increase the industrial activity within the corridor, which would also require additional trains. The aim is to we would use electric trains as a our, our primary goal is to try and utilize hydrogen fuel cells to make the trains as quiet as possible. There will be freight trains and Canadian Pacific are looking at installing hydrogen fuel cell locomotives in the corridor as well. So we're taking on the back of that. One of the biggest issues is the whistles through the towns and by eliminating great crossings, by using over bridges or making them enhance their safety so that they don't require a whistle to be blown, you get the noise abatement. If nobody else has any, I have one more. <laughs> um, so you had it listed as $10 million per bridge. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the rail system that goes through Black Faults. We have two um, crossings, which effectively can block a substantial portion of our town from being able to access the rest of the community or get out of town without quite the detour around the entire community. Are you expecting the federal government or the provincial government to pay for those upgrades, or would you be expecting the municipality to pay for those upgrades? All infrastructure upgrades, all with rail enhancements, which come through the P3 model. So you would be expecting the municipality to pay for a Not necessarily, of it. we would, it would, it would, so that's kind of a discussion for a later date. There is, we going to do it for a P3 model. If the federal government or the provincial government was not willing to engage that way, we would be forced to go with the private model. Because the infrastructure, the infrastructure is the biggest cost. It's the, it's effectively known as the killer to most of these high infrastructure, these public transit uh, projects. Mm -hmm. It's the infrastructure cost. From my estimates, uh, cost estimates and revenue forecasts, we can operate, we can cover operating costs, no problem. But it's the infrastructure cost, that's why we want to go down the P3, the public private partnership model, because the infrastructure, that initial massive capital outlay to build the bridges, to enhance the grade crossings, to build the stations, to enhance the line, that's a massive outlay on the front end. And that's what we need help with. Uh, whether it's a matter of how much the province is willing to con contribute, how much the federal government is willing to contribute, my initial estimates come in and saying I'm not really expecting the municipalities to contribute them that much. I wouldn't put a, I'm not at this point in time going to put a figure on that, but I would say, you know what, I'm, I would more view it as a contribution by the province and the Fed, federal government and private, rather than burden the municipalities with it. But that's a discussion. That's going to happen. I've got to have that discussion with the federals and that whole discussion is still going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm not expecting, I'm not putting the onus and saying that the municipalities are paid for this. No, I'm looking at the provincial government and the federal government through the Alberta Community Transit Fund, which would require municipal sign-off for those funds, for us to allocate those funds, and also the New Building Canada Fund and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. Because okay. this is what this project is for, it's an infrastructure project. Thank you. Yep. How many stops would you have between Calgary and Edmonton? In total, I think it's 23. So the aim is to catch everybody. Now, whether those stops are actual stops or whether they end up being on cross stops and whether all 23 get built in, in the initial phase, that's, that's the debate. Also, but the aim is to, once you do have the full build out would be to start introducing express trains. So, whether that's an express train that goes from Edmonton straight to Red Deer and then stops along the way to get people into Calgary, and same vice versa, or whether it's just like an express train that goes from Edmonton, Red Deer, Calgary, or whether there's trains that stop at special locations within the 
area. It's being is to connect all the time because I want to connect this this whole idea is not high speed rail. This is not high speed rail at all. We're not going to bypass all communities. The aim is to serve the communities. That's where we're going to have 23. Maybe places like Morningside actually end up not having a station because the ridership or the the need of the community is just so small that it's not worth having a stop there. Or it turns into a request stop that only sees one or two trains a day. That's all still it's still to be figured out. The aim is to serve all the communities and there are 23 identified stops at the moment. Whether they're maybe 24, maybe they're maybe 25, maybe they're maybe 19. The aim is to serve all towns and cities, all the communities within the corridor. I know it takes a long time to travel the train, but if you live in Calgary and you can afford to fly, you can't fly unless you move up the express train. In which case, it would only take less than 22 hours to get from Calgary to Edmonton. Uh, Brenda, uh, we had a very good conversation yesterday afternoon, and we discussed mental illness. And in Wetaskiwin, they have a lack of mental illness uh, capability. And often, uh, families or children, or, you know, people that are in need, have to find a taxi. Often, they don't have much money and they can't drive. Uh, to go to Millet for uh, mental uh, health or uh, Leduc. And currently, they're actually looking at budgeting over, uh, I think it's uh, twenty dollars round trip right now to assist people because the local community cannot provide the supports necessary. Um, we brought up the fact that some people four dollars to go, let's say, from Black Bolts to Red Deer to the hospital, versus having to take a taxi and back. So there's a lot of other nuances that can come through this, which are amazing, you know, in the big picture, and. Uh, Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services could really need um, really need some help there. Majority of the people that are elderly, um, I know my father can't drive, he's 82. My mother luckily can still drive, she's 80, but in the next couple of years she won't be. So where does she go if she has to see a, a clinic in Calgary from Airdrie? Right now, if it wasn't for family, it'd be a taxi, right? So what we're pointing out is, is once the station's here, it, it's for the community and we'll be sure the community to decide uh, what, what works for the community. That's what we're finding along the way, and it's very getting both the overpass. They've already decided where they want the overpass. They're giving us a preliminary plan probably by January. They, they, they've had this stuff on the books for years. So we have to start with one overpass, and with one overpass, we can start building out, making things more effective for people so they don't have to. Like I live in Airdrie, same thing. Sometimes the train gets stopped, and uh, you could have backups right across the East Airdrie from uh, where the uh, CPU. Uh, rail passes through on Veterans Boulevard. So these are things we've lived with for 50, 60 years. Provincial government and federal government have failed to work with CP to address these for the local uh, towns and communities like Black Falls. So I think what we're saying right now is if we get a thumbs up here, it's very important for us um, to then go back to the decision makers in the Canadian Infrastructure Bank and say, look, these three items have been sitting and say Airdrie's or Black Falls wish list now for two decades overpasses so we don't have to deal with the stops in town caused by the rail traffic and for us that's that that's without that i really don't think uh, we're going to get by because we really have to improve the infrastructure with respect to uh, travel along this corridor and more importantly the communities needs to be able to um, network better so if uh, black vaults is the best hockey team let's say well maybe uh, you know you could put together a special train as an example and uh, coordinate that to go to an old, old scheme, vice versa. Everything there from healthcare is really important. And um, if, I'm sure you've traveled to Germany or England. These would be regional rail trains that do stop every uh, 10, 15 minutes. And off the stops when you go to Mel, two minutes. As a general rail train that the um, spoke about the bridge over the pass and restricting, and I think actually what you're probably getting at is the bridge will be too encompassing within the center of town and it will just drop a lot of the locals and residents. There are things you can do to enact grade crossing to improve the safety and that can all it's would be equivalent to um, putting in an overpass, except of course the train going through it would have still got the got the way, but for pedestrians you can have a pedestrian overpass only. And you then negate the need to even then have whistles so you can use the noise abatement. Still with an enhanced grade crossing. Thanks. Um, 
Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just in listening to some of the other questions that sort of had me thinking as well. So in areas like the train that in our town that goes straight through, there's not necessarily a lot of room on either side, I would think, to potentially twin that um, in going through town, considering the number of roads that it crosses. So would it be, because there's so many different train lines that go from north to south, um, or sorry, I went to Calgary, like how, yeah, I'm curious as to how that would be addressed running straight through town where there's not necessarily room to twin or do anything like the overpasses. The, well, here's a good the example. Corridor, the, the rail corridor, yeah. CPE's right of way, it's 100 feet, it's right. 100 feet. And we only and need through to... towns, it does in some places get restricted to about 50. Yeah. But a rail line, an actual rail line, the structural gauge of a railway line is only, it's uh, three and a half meters, it's about two and a half meters. Yeah. So we're looking at about 10 feet. Yeah. And generally, 10 feet for an actual rail line. So that's all the rail line. So you've got 50 feet. You can technically, and this is what Canadian Pacific want to do, is they want to put, say, they've got enough space to put four lines down through there. There's plenty of space to put in a twin line. There are there are some cases you're talking they were probably looking at there's some sites that cars and everything for previous industry that was in the place. That would all just get ripped out. Because that industry has now moved out of town into one of the industrial parks or has moved elsewhere. So there is enough space to install a twin line. There's enough space to put four lines in that corridor. So there's, and that would be, I think the chance of that happening is probably non-existent. But with passenger rail, a two line, as if twinning the line doesn't just double the capacity of the line. At the moment, there's 24, they now have about 24, 26 trains a day. There's another train every 45 minutes. That's the theoretical design capacity of it because there's a turnout every 16 kilometers, I think it is. So they can run a train every 45 minutes. If you turn the line, you can still have a train every 45 minutes, but in each direction. But you can actually have a train every 15 minutes. And with certain signaling systems, you can have a train every 10 minutes. That actually makes means that for a twin line, you actually can have a capacity of 266 trains a day. That's why I can say that the twin line has the capacity of a four lane highway or a six lane highway. Because that's how many trains you can put through it, and that's how many cars and lanes you can remove off the highway. Yes, you're getting more trains. You already have trains within the corridor, an environmental aspect that exists. We're not adding any additional noise because the noise exists. What we're aiming to use is quieter trains and use noise abatement. There's a lot of noise abatement techniques that can be used, a lot of infrastructure, even in the ballast and in the rails themselves, and then sometimes in the wheel sets. You can do noise abatement within the right of way. So there is a lot of things. Yes, I am, there is a concern. A lot of people do have concern with noise. Oh, it's going to lead to more trains. That's going to lead to more noise. It's going to keep me up at night and everything. There are means and ways to abate that. They run. Rail isn't something new. It's not something we have to rethink, reinvent the wheel for. You can go to Japan, Asia, Europe, France, Germany, the UK. You can go to Australia. They have rail lines that run through the middle of their towns. They do things, and there are things that can be done that exist right now that can be implemented. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You say you can come to me, and you can say, okay, yeah, we like this project, but we have a concern with this residential community right here. And I can go, okay, you know what? In Australia, they do this. In Japan, they do this. In Europe, they do this. Which one would you like to see? Would you like to see an avenue of trees? Would you like to see a decorated concrete wall? That can be uh, you can design it as a living wall. So you can have plants growing up it and everything, or you can have like a cage system, a fence system. There's various different like type of noise abatements you can use to do things. So although yes, there are going to be more trains running through, but there are things that we can do to negate the impact of those trains. So a good, good example is um, if you take a look at Airdrie, and we did a very basic noise study. I live in Airdrie. Um, if you take a cell phone and you stand over top of the walkway over uh, QE2 any time of the day, 
um, and you watch how noisy that is, there's two or three minutes, there's people living along that, they find a way of getting around it. Um, rail, if you don't have to toot the horn all the time, is a lot quieter. Um, and in, as long as it can, can uh, move through the town at consistent speed, um, it's, it's a lot safer as well. Um, it's, it's just quite interesting. So the challenge sometimes is if you look at the future without this, how many further cars are going to be going up and down the two-way? Um, there's four million people currently between Edmonton and Calgary corridor. And it's set to grow uh, in the next decade to over 4.5 million. So the one question I have is, um, looking at this area, and we've talked about it, what other jurisdictions have 4.5 million people in a corridor between, uh, say, Red Deer and Edmonton or Red Deer and Calgary that uh, you can travel within an hour and a half? You have to go to, go to Germany and get uh, locations like that as dense as what we currently have. So in the big picture, I think it would be uh, beneficial and allows us to reimagine transit-oriented design, affordable housing uh, near the downtown cores or near towards the, where the rail stations are. Um, my, my kids don't even drive. They can't afford a vehicle. My son's 21. He still doesn't have a driver's license. Uh, when I was his age, I think it was about two days after I turned uh, 16, I had, I had a driver's license. I born in January. I was the best friends of everybody until they got theirs. So things have really changed dramatically, the cost of insurance. Uh, just look at the cost of vehicles now. The first car I bought was fifty nine ninety five in nineteen eighty one, I believe, and uh, the current vehicles nowadays are ten times that. So there, there's a lot of things to consider on a social economic level as well. How many passenger cars, or how long would the train be? The passenger train would be restricted to five or six cars depending on our ultimate design of what we can do in Edmonton. Calgary, dangerous to have it fully accessible. So I did a little design study at Calgary. The goal of the Calgary station is to have an exit going on to Central First Street Southwest, an exit going on to First Street Southeast, both being accessible entrances and exits. So it'd be a, a slope. The slope design is, or disabled is 2%. You can get away with so I did a calculation on two percent grade getting down to the sidewalk and to the side from the platform and then determine the length of the station we require. In that scenario we can get I guess eight cars, eight units in that area. Edmonton is again different but depending on how it's signed so that's why I say you can't say it's six cars. Some of the multiple unit consists are two or three multiples so that's why six became a good number to work with. So that'll be the size of the tracks. That's also the size of the, the stations and the station footprint. We're not building, we're not building Go Train. I don't know if you know the Go Train, they run 15 car trains. We're not even going near that because the number of people is a lot less. And our restrictions in Calgary and Edmonton are so big that we just cannot fit that in. That's why we insist on doing an enhanced track and between the track. Because then we can get so many more trains instead of having a train every hour. You could run a train every five minutes, or even two minutes. If there are only six cars and we don't have any freight, we don't have any train interference in peak hours, we could run a train every two minutes. Well, you've answered some of my questions as well. There are similar questions to other councillors. Um, I, I was glad to hear that you mentioned hydrogen. That was one, going to be one of my questions as to whether you're looking at alternative fuel. Uh, Particularly hydrogen. Hydrogen. I know that's a big, uh, a big push in our province right now. So, uh, in that respect, I think you could gain some support there. Um, I, I am a little concerned about uh, the speeds that are potentially involved here. I know that you talked about uh, track and crossing enhancements for that. Do you, you anticipate right now, without any uh, upgrades, whether or not this service could could move ahead, or is this contingent upon having uh, upgrades to the track in order? Again, efficiency and speeds. The CP corridor track is considered to be a class one, <coughs> which allows, because it carries oil, it has to be a class one. So that allows for freight to travel at 80 kilometers an hour and passenger trains to travel at 130 kilometers an hour. So, and we could we could purchase a seamless charger locomotive and a couple of Bombardier bi level passenger cars and run them on that on that line because those units are freight compatible, they're CFR compliant. Via Rail just purchased their brand new Siemens Charger and Siemens Ventura 
co passenger coaches and GoTrain uses uh, MPI locomotive and Bombard Aston Bombardier bi level passenger cars. EXO Montreal uses a Bombardier locomotive and Bombardier passenger cars. They're all CFR compliant and all use with freight. This, the equipment, the wrong stock is off the shelf. I could even go to a I could even go to the Battle River Railway, grab one of their trains and run it down here as a passenger service. So do you anticipate that there's um, most stops or at least most distances the train's going to be able to get up to you know significant speeds, 120, 130 kilometers an hour? With a passenger train and with modern technology and passenger services, you probably if you think about a freight line, a freight is pulling like 200 cars sure. yeah. plus, and so it has a limited because they're there are knuckle connections, there's a play, so they have to, I learned to drive a train a long time ago, and you have to play with the throttle and make sure that you catch all the cars so you don't break any knuckles, and so that's why they have a very slow acceleration once they pull all the knuckles and they're all under tension, then they can start accelerating a lot more, that's why it takes so long to accelerate. For the passenger train being only six cars, and for them to be directly linked, the acceleration can be, the acceleration can be really fast, but of course you wouldn't want to have it too fast, otherwise people fall over and spoil drinks on the, on the seats. So the aim is to have the acceleration at about between 1 meters per second, second and 0.75 meters per second per second, which is practically something like three times the speed of a freight train accelerator. So they would pass through the town fairly quickly. They would be able to, they would be able to reach their speed, if I don't like that this correctly, they would be able to reach their speed within two minutes. Do you anticipate this creating jobs or a significant number of jobs and how many might that I put my hand up on that. So I say hydrogen fuel cells. Um, I used to work with Canada Super Railway, um, working directly with the chief engineer responsible for that project uh, behind the scenes. We are looking to partner with CP as well as their partners. We actually uh, also made a contact uh, about two months ago uh, from an Austrian company that's currently providing hydrogen fuel cell technology to uh, train sets in France and Germany. So yeah, we're. My job is global sourcing. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, if you know anybody who's working here in Blackfolds in the Central Alberta region that's working on a project like this, please have them reach out to us. Um, we also spoke with uh, Rohe and Concrete Ties. Uh, they last longer. Uh, creosote isn't too good for the environment. You, if you go up and down the right of way here, you see a bunch of uh, beat up old ties. And uh, today I just had a conference call with uh, one of the world's largest manufacturers. Uh, they might be interested in investing $12 million in Alberta to build ties here in the province for both CP and CN. So there's lots of opportunity. So anybody that you know that um, it has an idea, bring it forward, because we're, we've got a little inner group, but we're basically uh, putting a consortium together with a lot of Alberta businesses uh, that want, they're putting their hands up right now and saying, look, we're working this direction in the next five years, we think we'll be there. Can we, can we be a partner of this? Of course. My job is to make sure we've got the best in class. I'm talking to IT uh, professionals right now in Waterloo, Ontario. I can talk to them in Calgary and Edmonton as well. There's a lot of brilliant um, IT um, here in Alberta that we can make a uh, far better system that's currently available. Um, so that's on hydrogen, all the good stuff. Um, I used to live in Seattle. When I first lived in Seattle in 1990 to 94, you had to take the highway. Uh, I-5 was choked, and uh, basically I would go, it took me less time to go 10 miles um, on a bicycle than it was to take the freeway. And uh, in the last 30 years since I left, they've developed uh, the Sounder, and the Sounder actually starts uh, down in Tacoma, goes all the way up to Everett, but uh, trains leaving roughly the same type of frequencies would be planning. Uh, their top speed is 79 miles an hour, so just about 125 kilometers an hour. And um, you know, ridership has recovered since COVID had hit them, um, partly because the traffic situation is very bad there, of course. Um, but uh, ultimately, where I used to live, I used to be able to walk over. Um, uh, there was a, I was right across the street from the golf course, and there was just strip malls everywhere. Now it's all been built up. They have the uh, Kent Station, where the brand new ice hockey rink, just like yours, where the Seattle Thunderbirds play. I can't even recognize the place with the transfer and design that. This happened since you know, since I left the last 25, 30 years. So I think the big picture is this is an opportunity to revitalize downtown communities. There's land developers been sitting on land for 20, 30 years, um, hoping to do something, but it just doesn't make sense since all the traffic's on two way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing you didn't discuss there is uh, how many people per uh, train set, like 
how many, you know, you said there's five cars, so how many people per car coach that you'd be estimating? So for body bi-level cars can take a hundred and about 150 people. It's about 120, about 120 sitting seats. But the remaining we can do standing or various other things. So let's see, we got 150. So we have 750, 800 passengers. Each of the coaches has uh, four wheelchair locations. Each of the wheelchair locations has a laptop stand as well as uh, charging stands. Um, uh, we, we envision we're going to have food service. Maybe uh, if we have a little bit more time at Blackwell, so there's a local baker. They, they might have a minute or two in the trolley, race down and sell some cinnamon buns. These are all the things we can do uh, in local communities. And it is, you know, as we're pointing out, it's, you guys are creative. Um, if you have an asset, uh, it'll work. Without the asset, we can't do a lot of these things. There are indirect benefits and there are direct benefits. Yeah. Yes, of course. We would have a station master and doing our station stuff, and there's all that items to do with, and there's the locomotive engineer, and there's the guard on the train. So we will have, as well as having a driver, there will also be a conductor on the train to deal with the issues, the issues that occur on the train. So that's like direct, direct employment, and then there's the construction employment. So mm -hmm. there's the actual building of the track, and so using local companies to build the station and Depending on how big the station could be, the station could be an entire block. We could manage to take over an entire block and build a really good transit oriented design facility that includes a bus stop to a local busing and an office set up, residential, commercial, portable housing, all those kind of things. Or it could just be a simple slab on trade. It's, that's the plan that can be done. There are, the direct benefits can be easily quantifiable. We know how many people are going to employ, we know how many people are going to construct. The indexes are the unknowns, and that's the where the creativity of the population comes in. Suddenly they go, hey, you know what, we can do this now. And now there's a train station here, we can do this. Now there's a train station there, we can do that. I can, I can now expand my business. Oh, I don't need to live in Calgary. I can move back to Black Falls, and I can do this. There's a lot of induced demand, there's a lot of induced direct, indirect benefits. There are also a lot of costs in not doing it because those opportunities are lost if you don't do it. Yeah. And if you added uh, extra two lanes to QE2, it's going to be two to four times higher. And the maintenance costs are a lot lower in the rail industry. You know, a lot of people don't recognize it, but uh, steel on steel is a lot less friction than a uh, uh, dual train uh, going up and down the highway. You know, one of these big semis that has two trailers on top. Each train is its own snow plow. Yeah. Not everybody who drives a car, well, very practically nobody who drives a car has actually a snow plow on their vehicle. Whereas every train will have a snow plow, so we don't need to invest in additional snow clearing equipment because the train is the snow clearing equipment on the, on the track. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, definitely some new work, and, uh, and uh, it's going to make for a good conversation. We'll definitely take the, the information and have, thank a, you very much. have a good discussion about it, and, and yeah. I'm sure our administration can follow up. When I started looking at this well, 10 years ago, I was just I was blown away when I did the research. I'm from the UK, I'm used to catching trains. They catch a train all the time. Right? But to come here and then see the, the potential here is amazing. Something that I took for granted in the UK could easily be implemented here. Just but, but if you haven't seen it and haven't seen how it works, then you really have no idea. It's a shift in mindset. It's a shift in mindset and bring it in. So that's why it's like, I'm starting to do this, is because there's a lot of people who already haven't. And you know, this is what you can do. This is what is available. This is the options that you have. This is what you can do. This is what we can have here. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you, you as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Don't we'll forget your USB drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We have no public hearings. Uh, no business arising from the minutes. Uh, first order of business 7.1 uh, request for decision standing committee meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Worship. Uh, the uh, study committee that we have scheduled for uh, December 20th, uh, next week, uh, administration would respectively request that that meeting uh, be canceled. We uh, don't have uh, very much business uh, for to come forward. Uh, we have done uh, quite a cancellation in previous years as well, so we're looking for council to support that request. Thank you. Any questions or 
the comments from the council on that? So, seeing none, can I get a motion to either adopt or not? This councilor standing. Um, I will move that council cancel the standing committee meeting on December 20th, 2021. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? None is carried unanimously. I didn't think you'd get much resistance on that one if you don't have a lot to address. Uh, 7.2 request for decision rec, uh, rec board and policing committee resignations. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, at the December 1st uh, Recreation, Culture, and Parks Board meeting, the email was presented uh, from Erin Davies, or Davis, uh, resigning uh, her member at large term effectively immediately. Um, the board uh, shall consist of eight members. Five members shall be appointed by council uh, from the public at large. Two shall be appointed from the council of the town of Black Falls, and one should be appointed by the Cone County. And uh, those uh, shall be made or reviewed. Uh, Annually at the organizational meeting of council. Uh, Councillors Bob had moved that the Recreation Culture Board accept the resignation of, of member Aaron Davis in respect and send it forward to council for final approval. Uh, the resignation leaves the Recreation Culture Park Board with one member at large vacancy at, this, uh, at the December 8th, 2021 Policing Committee. The resignation of Louise Rellis was announced. Uh, Louise Rellis resigned from her position on the committee effective on um, October 29th. Uh, bylaw 1125 uh, backslash 11 states that the committee shall consist of seven voting members who shall be appointed by resolution of council as follows two council appointments and five citizens residing within the town of Black Falls. Councilor Spaw moved that the committee accept the resignation of Louise Relative with regrets and was carried unanimously. Uh, so that leaves uh, the police and committee with one member vacancy. Uh, volunteers have been recruited and screened by the FCSS volunteer program and two volunteers. Um, are recommended by administration to fill these positions. Um, administrative recommendation that council move to formally accept the resignation of Aaron Davis from the Recreation, Culture, and Parks Board, uh, effective immediately with regrets. And second, uh, recommendation that council move to formally accept the resignation of Louise Rellis from the Policing Committee, effectively with regrets. Thank you. And yes, Councilor Sandy. Um, so I'm just curious, I think this is the first time I've ever seen a resignation come forward, let alone two, without the letters included as part of the agenda package, and I'm wondering why they weren't included. Um, I don't have that information, Council. I'd have to get that information. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we do have two motions that are being sought. Deputy Mayor Powell. Thank you. Uh, I move, or sorry, yeah, I move the council move to formally accept the resignation of Aaron Davis from the Recreation, Cultural, and Parks Board, effective immediately with regrets. Any comments? If, if not, I call the question. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. And a second motion. Uh, I think I saw Councillor Sands. Yeah. I'll move the council uh, move to formally accept the resignation of Louise Rellis. Uh, from the policing committee effective immediately with regrets. Thank you. All in favor? And that is also carried unanimously. Thank you so much. Uh, 7.3 uh, the appointments for those two vacant positions. Uh, so, the appointments um, relative to the, this previous discussion item uh, includes uh, uh, volunteer uh, trend. Approach. Uh, reached out to the volunteer program regarding the process to be appointed uh, to the uh, to board to a board and committee, and due to the deadline passing and short turnaround time for the organization, we, we could not be considered for a recommendation at that time. As the or annual organizational meeting, council was unable to appoint Mike Walker to the policing committee due to bylaw constraints. As a result of the resignations, the volunteer program has reached out to both Mike Walker and Trent Approach. As they express your interest in filling these positions. Uh, if council appointment has made these positions, would fill the board committee as outlined in the bylaws. Uh, the administrative recommendation that council move to appoint Mike Walker as a member at large to the policing committee for a three year term effective immediately and ending October 31st, 2024. And secondly, that council move to appoint Trent Croach, at, Croach as a member at large to the Black Falls District Recreation, Culture, and Parks Board for a three year term 
effective immediately and ending October 31st, 2024. Thank you. Any questions from the council? My only question, now that's not quite three years. Is there any reason why we would need to reword that? Three years is just a, a round number. It's, it's going to be slightly less than three years. Right? It's, ending, it's ending at the typical time that uh, we would do our organizational measure. Okay. So seeing no questions, we do have two motions. Entertain Councillor Swab. I'll move that council appoint Mike Walker as a member at large to the policing committee for a three year term effective immediately and ending October 31st, 2024. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? All in favor? Thank you. That's carried unanimously. And our second motion. Councillor Dennis. I'll move that count or sorry, the council moved to appoint Trent Croach as a member at large to the Black Falls and District Recreation Culture Parks Board for a three year term, effective immediately and ending October 31st, 2024. Thank you. Discussion or debate? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is also carried unanimously. Item 7.4 Development Officer Appointments. Your Worship, uh, Section uh, 1.4.2 of the Town of Black Hills Land Use Bylaw 1198.16 requires that development officer be appointed by resolution of council. Uh, development officers are needed to ensure compliance with the land use bylaw. And currently, there's only one development officer appointed, uh, which is Billy Scott. With recent staffing changes, the department must ensure sufficient resources to allow uh, the continued uh, appropriate developments to occur as the town grows. The town has recently promoted uh, Candace Hilgerson to the Development Officer 1 position and is re requesting that Council establish her position by appointing her via resolution. For additional coverage, the Planning and Development Manager Jolene Hagel is also requested to be designated as a Development Officer by a resolution at this time. Thank you. Did you get the name right? Did you get the name right? Okay. He's doing better than I was going to do. I never said it first. So. <laughs> Any questions from Council? Uh, seeing none, we do have two appointments. Councillor Standing. I'm um, a bit council here by appoint Candace Hilgerson as a development officer for the town of Black Falls. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, the second motion for Julie. Councillor Swab. I'll move that council here by appoint Jolene Takel as the development officer for the town of Black Falls. Thank you. Discussion or debate? Seeing none, all in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you so much. 7.5, the uh, notice of intent for the Soper property annexation. How's your table? Good evening, Your Worship, and members of council. Earlier this year, um, a county landowner approached both the town of Black Falls and the County of Lacombe expressing his uh, his desire to have his quarter section annexed into the town of Black Falls. Uh, his property is in the extreme southeast corner of the town, outside of the town, my apologies. And uh, so this matter was taken to council in April and council directed administration to go ahead and, and initiate this annexation. So in response to that, uh, town administration has had preliminary discussions with both Lacombe County and the initiating landowner, and we have now prepared a draft notice of intent, which is required under the Municipal Government Act and the Land and Property Rights Tribunal procedures. And this acts as the initial fan out the start of the annexation process. Um, if we receive this resolution this evening, uh, that notice of intent will be going out to Lacombe County and all of the referral agencies mentioned in the, in the NGA and 11 property rights tribunal procedures. With respect to financial implications, um, annexations will have financial implications which haven't been quite fleshed out at this, at this time. This being a landowner initiated annexation, it is a little different. Um, we have reached out to legal and have, have yet to really get some resolve on what kind of costs we'll be responsible for. But that said, council needs to be aware that there will be some costs. And some things that we are aware of at this point is that Lacombe County, um, this parcel contains the Mary and Cliff Soper natural area, and Lacombe County has put in some park amenities, and they'd be looking at some reimbursement on that. And then, of course, filing the notice of intent and hosting the open houses and all that come with, with 
cost as well. So the council, um, the administrative recommendation before you is that council authorize a notice of intent to initiate the annexation process of the land parcel identified as the Northeast 243727 West of the Fourth Meridian and provide this written, written notice of intent to Lacombe County and all other parties as per the Municipal Government Act and the Land and Property Rights Tribunal annexation procedure rules. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any questions? Uh, Deputy Merkel. Thank you. Um, so my question then is, as we don't have an idea yet on the costs, after filing the notice of, of intent, is there, if, if we get to the point where we, the costs are determined and we don't want to proceed, is there still an option to do that? Or by filing the notice of intent, does it mean that we intend to move forward regardless? Through Mayor Hoover, um, it's, it's my understanding that we can pull out of the process at any time. The notice in, of intent doesn't formalize the formal application to the Land and Property Rights Tribunal. Mm -hmm. That comes in the negotiation report that will be presented to council before that gets sent off there. So it's, it's my understanding that at any time within this, even once it's filed, we have the option to withdraw. Okay, so then before anything is finalized, you would have a better idea or a more concrete idea of the costs and be able to make everything. That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions? It's quite a quite a thorough document. Uh, I found lots of great information in there. I'm not sure what these are supposed to look like, but I didn't. It answered more questions than I would have even thought to come up with. So clearly, we would have to incur some legal costs up front. That would be the only thing that at this point that we are committing to in terms of costs. Correct? That is correct. Yes. And then do you, uh, do you have an idea what the application cost is typically with? Uh... Sure. Once we're ready to apply to the Land and Property Rights Tribunal, it's a $300 application. Oh, fee. Okay. And, and I know that the, my understanding is with the, uh, with the natural area, the facilities are literally brand new. I think they went in just this past year. That's my understanding. So we would, we would be gaining uh, a pretty large natural area park with uh, with brand new facilities. So essentially, uh, we wouldn't have to go and make any repairs or, or any upgrades with that. In terms of uh, what we gain, it, it's quite a feeling. And this is something that was looked at prior, uh, is my understanding. This was in the last uh, 2009, I believe, annexation. This, this would have been something that would have been annexed at that time. It you know, one for the fact that, uh, that Mr. Soper was on council for the county, correct? That is absolutely correct. Because should that land have been annexed, he would have had to resign his seat from the county, from okay. county council. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So we do have a recommendation uh, to, to consider. Yes, Councillor Sands. No, I was just going oh, to make a question. motion. I was going to make a motion. Yes, there's no other questions. Uh, Comments, I'll, I'll accept the motion. Okay. I'll move that council authorize the notice of intent to initiate the annexation process of the land parcel identified as Northeast 24 39 27 west of the fourth meridian and provide this written notice of intent to Lacombe County and all other parties as per the Municipal Government Act and the Land and Property Rights Tribunal Accent Annexation Procedure Rules. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing that, I call the question all in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you so much. 7.6 capital budget. Director DeBresso. Thank you, Your Worship Council. Uh, before you, you have the 2022 capital budget. The capital, uh, the capital plan or the capital budget was presented at the November 15th Standing Committee uh, meeting where feedback was received with the motion to bring forward uh, for approval. There's been a couple of changes since we did present uh, in November. One of them was uh, we did uh, remove the 2A LED sign and there's been a, a change in the uh, scope for the chemical control system for the epicenter. The layout for the existing mechanical room is too restrictive for what they had planned and the reduced budget down to 14,000 as it's gonna be an identical uh, swap over now. The center plaza had a significant change um, from two, two different uh, avenues there. Uh, the, the town was successful in obtaining a grant from the Canadian Community Revitalization Fund. This grant allowed for the town to 
and town to expand the scope and need it to utilize the full grant. The grant will cover 75% of the cost and the administration is also, also pursuing sponsorship opportunities for the remaining 25 cents, uh, 25%. Subsequent to, uh, to that grant, uh, we are happy to announce that um, we did uh, get a sponsor for the remainder of that. Um, we are in the final um, uh, the final stages of uh, the agreement there, but uh, Board of Hayden, Hayden has come along uh, with a seven-year agreement to, to sponsor that area. So, in essence, uh, that full scope of the the uh, Santa Plaza up to six hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars has been fully paid for via the grant as well as the sponsorship. So in saying that, um, if there's any further questions, or I can address them, but the administration uh, recommendation is the council move to accept the recommendation of the administration to approve the 2022 budget as presented. Thank you. Questions or information needed from anyone on council? Thank you, Mary Bell. Thank you. Not a question, just a uh, more of a congratulations and thank you on the receiving of the grant. And uh, the team that was involved in that was significant. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and my comment slash question. So this is a seven-year sponsorship. So it, in other words, we would likely be uh, be able to realize uh, an additional sponsorship after that expires. Is something that we would consider. For sure. Any any uh, possibility of extension in that contract, or is it just flat seven years? Yes, we're not that far through the, the agreement at this okay. stage, but it is, they, they did come to the table in seven years, so definitely we'll, we'll uh, pursue a cost of opportunity to pass that. Ms. Councilor Stendi. I'm prepared to move that Council accept the recommendation of administration to approve the 2022 capital budget as presented. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? No, seeing none, I call the question all in favor. And that is carried unanimously. And 7.7, .7, uh, request for decision on the operating budget, the interim operating budget. Yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship the Council. Before you, you have the 2022 interim operating budget. The operating budget is a core document that provides financial guidance and information to administration regarding how Council wishes to manage the operations of the municipality. Section 2.2 of the NGA um, requires that the budget be approved prior to the start of each calendar year. Um, as per Council's decision in um, June 22nd, uh, the interim bu operating budget will be brought forward for Council's approval uh, before uh, the year end. This will be followed uh, by a review of the draft budget and then uh, approval of the final uh, budget in the spring of 2022. Attached is the proposed 2022 interim operating budget, which is a carbon copy of 2021. Uh, the report here displays a high level of the overview of the operations. Uh, the report also contains operating revenues and expenses by division and by geo category. As you can see, there's no changes there. It's just uh, we need the, the approval to spend funds in January. Uh, so at this stage, uh, the administration recommendation is that the council move to accept the 2022 interim operating budget as presented. And, and any questions? Questions from council? And just to clarify, this is typical that we would typically adopt the interim budget based on the previous budget year. I think we have uh, at least as long as I've been on council, and then we, and then any changes that we consider would, would take place in typically every March. Correct. Yeah. And on being an election year, um, we did push the the budget in. The next three years will be on time. Um, we'll have a full budget for you at this meeting in December. But just being an election year, we like to give it a little bit more time as we're busy in that September, October. And then uh, with the new councils coming on board, we'd like to, to extend it out a little bit. But yeah, definitely uh, the City Red Year does it uh, each year and every year, but um, next year we'll be uh, finalizing our budget at this time. Thank you. So we do have a motion. Consider uh, Deputy Mayor Powell. Okay. What? Well, Those are signs. Those are signs. I didn't see first. No, that's all right. I'll move that council uh, accept the 2022 interim operating budget as presented. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, all in favor, and that is carried unanimously. So we have uh, 
one piece of action correspondence to request for a letter of support for the AJHL showcase. Yes, Your Worship, and uh, Council in front of us right now, we do have uh, the AJHL showcase that uh, we can uh, take part in on September 5th, October 1st, and 2nd of uh, 2022. Uh, this will be a showcase that hosts all 16 teams in the Alberta Junior Hockey League for three day game format. And we will have NHL scouts and NCA American colleges all at the game, fans and friends, and it's going to be a Zoom. So it's going to be a huge economic spinoff, and we'd like to have more support that goes to the Bulldogs and will go to the AJHL at that point. Any questions? What was the date again? Uh, September 30th, October 1st, and 2nd. So it's right before my hockey starts, right? So we use both facilities, we use all the meeting rooms, everything will be used in that facility. And letters required by Friday. Uh, yeah, letters required by Friday. That's why we got it. He told us today, I get a letter by Friday, so you got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. The mayor is a felon. Thank you. Uh, I'm prepared to move the Council Direct Administration to provide a letter of support for the AJHL showcase. Thank you. I would fully agree. This is uh, something. Does, does this have any? Sorry, I didn't get a chance to ask a question. Any any economic or, or sorry, any costs associated to this stuff other than just typically our facility staff? Just our staff. Okay, just the economic staff that we'll get from our uh, two hotels and hopefully right. maybe we'll and entice an hotel tell in the community, but <laughs> all the restaurants and gas stations, that kind of stuff, it's going to be a huge impact, that's for sure. Yeah. Discussion or debate? Seeing none, I call the question all in favor? That's uh, carried down. So. Uh, information items 9.1 the proposed elementary school bill for the Red Deer Catholic Regional Schools. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, another good news item. Uh, Council is aware administration has been working with the Red Deer Catholic uh, Regional Schools uh, to lo locate a site for a new Catholic elementary school. Uh, previously, several site options were brought forward uh, and reviewed with Council uh, that uh, resulted in a chosen site location in Mathman Lakes West. Uh, this site is depicted on the land use uh, map that I provided at your workstations. Um, we have uh, started working with the developer on that. There is agreement uh, on for that land to be provided for the school. Uh, this project is number one priority for the Red Deer Catholic uh, Regional Schools. Uh, the funding application for the project has been submitted to the province uh, with considerable optimism that there will be a funding announcement uh, provided uh, this spring. Um, should funding be provided, uh, they are targeting opening for the new facility as early as September 2024. Um, it should be noted that St. Gregory's uh, uh, elementary school facility right now is at 100% capacity, so the school is uh, needed. Uh, the Red Deer Catholic Regional Schools uh, wants to work with the town of Black Falls. Uh, to make this public announcement through uh, press releases and other uh, avenues and uh, uh, get working on uh, getting this uh, excitement uh, building uh, for this uh, new school development. Thank you. Any questions from council? I will say I did attend last week the St. Gregory uh, Student Council and uh, I think that's an understatement to say that they're 100% uh, capacity. They're actually over capacity and they're adding two more portable units in order to uh, to keep up with with their uh, with their student numbers, so it's uh, which has been the case. I think they were almost at 100 percent capacity when they opened, and they've just been getting more densely populated the whole time. So this is definitely something needed. In that there will be some infrastructure improvements uh, needed on our part, and uh, we've included that in our 10-year capital plan for 2023. Okay, thank you. So this doesn't require, this is just something we're accepting for this information, information. along with everything else. Thank you. 9.2, uh, notice of subdivision application. This is something by the home county. Any questions? 9.3, Canada Community Revitalization Grant. This is the uh, yeah. the gathering space, correct? Director Martin. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Uh, Director Professor uh, Sloan Thunder. 
Um, <laughs> I, I was, thanks, Bill. So we did receive 501,000. I don't know why we got the extra grand, but we did. So we were supposed to get the maximum 500,000, but I think because we're good people, we got an extra thousand dollars. So of course, uh, with border paving, uh, I know it down really well, and uh, went to school with uh, the, the, uh, the owner, and um, he's uh, give us hundred thousand dollars for seven, uh, over seven years, and I think that speaks volumes for that company. It will be called the uh, Port Paving Plaza, which I, I think that's that's just awesome for, for that company. And of course, they get some money for the uh, for the Ivy Center as well too, and the Fitness Center. So um, we will be starting final design work in that in um, January, February, because with the grant, um, it has to be done. This project has to be done by June 30th. So we got to get on that right away. So we got to start design work in, in January, February. So to get that done. Thank you. And then we'll receive our five hundred one thousand dollars. <laughs> and I think I speak for everyone on council. This, this is fantastic news. We have been wrestling with this, uh, how this yes. project was going to unfold, uh, not just time wise, but but whether or not uh, we would scale it back in order to to ensure that we weren't going well beyond <laughs> what we initially uh, forecasted a bunch of resources. Perfect news. Yeah, and then we do have another sponsor as well too, uh, with DB Bobcat. So. We're close to there, and you're having this to have a sponsorship and also to have this grant to pay 995 percent of this, this good news. So we'll likely see some some uh, design proposals yes. by late January, early February, something like that? Yes, and also we'll be having a uh, media release here right away with um, report paper. So. Questions from Council? Thank you so much. 9.4 Building Development Permit Report. Comments or questions? Nine point five uh, enforcement services monthly report for November. Questions? Comments? Then a comment to both. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> There was a comment about the violation tickets for uh, running the school bus lights have dropped, but that's because it's dark for our cameras because we submit lots with our, with our buses and snow covered plates. So it goes down now until the nice weather hits and it'll go up again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. is the great at giving us updates on that at the policing committee and how big of a problem that that tends to be. But we, we are uh, very proactive about enforcing those bus infractions with, with your uh, bus drivers and your support. Thank you. Uh, 9.6 Bolt Transit Report for November. Questions or comments? Nine point seven City of Lacombe Council meeting highlights. Questions? I did notice that they also had a, uh, a electronic sign in their capital budget that they've also uh, put aside for the year, so there must be a problem with these signs. And nine point eight uh, Lacombe County Council meeting highlights for November. Questions? Comments? Can I get a motion to accept the information items? Councilor Sakar. I'll move to accept the information items as information. Thank you. Discussion? All in favor? That's carried unanimously. There is no roundtable discussion. We do have uh, minutes. First one from November 23rd, the regular council meeting. Any errors or omissions? A motion to adopt those minutes. Mayor Pell. Thank you. So moved. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. And the uh, minutes from the special council meeting, uh, November 28th. Here are the missions. Yeah, I think. Councilor Sands. Yeah, I, that was the uh, November 28th meeting. It says that I was present, but I was not present. 
in the east-west. That's correct. You were in a sunny, warm place. I was, yes. So can I get a motion to accept that as amended? First of all. I'll move to accept the special meeting minutes as amended. Thank you. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. No notices of motion. Uh, is there any business for the Yes. Sorry, I just noticed on the special council meeting, Monday was actually the 29th of November, not the 28th. As amended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll notice a motion. Any business for the good council? Seeing none, can I get a motion to go into a recess for, let's say, five minutes? Or whatever someone was, this council does. Yeah, I'll move to go for a five minute recess. Thank you. And we will be moving into in camera after that. Thank you. All in favor? And that's very good. Yeah, so. We're off, on, off the air. <laughs> 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 off the air. <laughs>